In the bustling cities and quiet towns of the United States, the names Bloods and Crips are notorious. These gangs, rooted in the streets of Los Angeles, have a dark reputation woven with violence, crime, and fear. Their colors, red for Bloods and blue for Crips, are symbols of a division that has claimed countless lives. Among the infamous wars, the tales of Seabiz's deadly confrontation and the haunting echoes of gunshots from the relentless battles between the 031 Bloods and ABM Crips in London's streets are grim reminders of a transatlantic nightmare. Now, when you hear Bloods and Crips, it probably conjures up images of palm trees, California sunshine, a lowrider driving down Slauson, or a Compton lowrise a la Boys in the Hood. Or maybe it makes you think of the modern day Bloods and Crips like Pop Smoke, Woo Walking and mobbing around the streets of Brooklyn rocking nothing but blue paisley, or perhaps you think of that fake New York blood 6ix9ine who did nothing but run around screaming Treyway. But I tell you what you don't think of, and that's the grey, rain-soaked blocks of South London. No. But how did these infamous American street gangs find their reflections across the Atlantic, in a place far removed from the sun-drenched lanes of LA? In the UK, a country known for its landmarks and royal heritage, the menace of street gangs is as real as in any other part of the world. The emergence of gang culture with distinct identity Identities, territories, and codes of conduct resembles the ways of the American Bloods and Crips. We journey into this mysterious world to unravel the threads that connect the menacing streets of Los Angeles to those of London and beyond. Amidst the late 1960s and early 1970s social unrest, the notorious street gangs Bloods and Crips emerged as formidable entities in Los Angeles. The aftermath of the Watts riots of 1965 bore witness to the birth of these gangs, as neighborhoods were drowning in the debilitating effects of poverty, unemployment, and crime. The origin of the Bloods. The Bloods are a predominantly African American street organization that originated in Los Angeles County in the early 1970s. The genesis of the Bloods is traced to the intense street violence that consumed the city in the late 60s and early 70s. The Crips were born from the ambition of Raymond Washington and Stanley Williams in 1969. They were realizing their vision to combine the scattered street gangs of South Los Angeles under one banner. With their distinct blue clothing and aggressive demeanor, the Crips didn't just occupy spaces, they dominated them. In the shadow of the Crips' growing power, the Bloods, a union of smaller gangs victimized by the Crips, came to be in 1972. United under the leadership of Sylvester Scott, or OG Puddin, they adopted red as their color. They ushered in an era of retaliatory violence that marked the beginning of a deadly rivalry. Raymond Washington was just 16 years old when he created what has now become one of the largest street gangs in the world. As the founder of the Crips, he planned to create multiple South Central Los Angeles, Watts, and Compton Crip gangs that would be united, protecting their neighborhoods from outside threats. But things would not go as he had planned, and the Crip gangs that Raymond Washington originally started eventually took on a life of their own. The expansion of the Bloods and Crips beyond the boundaries of Los Angeles is testimony to their significant influence. Though rooted in LA, these gangs have penetrated other major US cities. Their distinct red and blue logos mark territories far removed from their West Coast origins. Some gang members have relocated to cities like Atlanta, Baltimore, Chicago, Dallas, and Detroit in pursuit of new opportunities or the need to escape the cycle of violence in Los Angeles. Additionally, the gangs have adopted modern recruitment strategies utilizing platforms like social media and leveraging personal connections. This innovative approach to recruitment speaks to their adaptability and the evolution of gang dynamics in the digital age. The result is a combined membership exceeding 100,000, highlighting the gang's expansive network. Even though the Bloods and Crips started in Los Angeles, their influence has spread throughout America. Now, these gangs are not just known in the U.S., but have also made their way to the U.K. The culture and music from the U.S., especially hip-hop, have played a big part in bringing the gang culture across the Atlantic to the United Kingdom. Gangster rap music, with its raw portrayal and sometimes glorification of gang life, was a magnetic force attracting the British youth. It offered rhythm and lyrics, a sense of identity and belonging. The gangs weren't passive in their migration. Active recruitment in the UK, orchestrated through the global reach of social media and personal connections, breathed life into the UK chapters of the Bloods and Crips. Today, their presence is well established in major UK cities like London, Birmingham, and Manchester. Their criminal portfolio, mirroring their US counterparts, encompasses drug dealing, extortion, and robbery. The violence, a hallmark of their existence, underlines their activities in the UK. The streets of the UK, 
echoing with the rhythms of gangster rap, bear witness to a legacy born in the heart of Los Angeles, yet being reflected thousands of miles away. The UK have thrown up blood or crip over the years. Most notably, the crew CGM, formerly 1011, of course home to teenage drill extraordinaire Digger D, and the likes of Rack 5 and Sav O. Ironically, the Ladbroke Grove area of London that they're from used to be a blood area. In fact, the leader of the Ladbroke Grove Bloods ended up getting nine years in jail along with 15 other Bloods for going on an armed rampage during the London riots where they even ran through a Michelin starred restaurant. I don't run my mouth, I just swing my shank. Just swing it. Loose, never made that run. Why you think MT1 got splashed? Joke, all rev on a gas. The streets of London echo with the piercing narratives of UK drill music a genre deeply entrenched in the city's evolving gang culture. Artists like Fredo and Seabiz, emerging from the intricacies of this underworld, become narrators of a tale woven with violence, loyalty, and retaliation. Tell the feds I ain't a drug dealer, but all cars fresh out the dealers. You can ask my Aki, and he can say what life. In Northwest London, areas like Stonebridge and Church Road are known for their ongoing territorial conflicts. These places are deeply influenced by UK drill music that often narrates these neighborhoods' power struggles and stories. It's a battle that has dragged on for over 25 years and continues to burn in the hearts of those affiliated. In this video, we're going to uncover the grimy history of this war. Not every event is documented here because doing so will simply take too much time and this is simply to tell the story. The beef between the Peckham boys and the Ghetto boys is one that really happened with a countless number of shots being fired and bodies being dropped. The Ghetto boys, rooted in Brixton's tumultuous landscape, were among the first to resemble the Bloods. They were founded in the 1990s and soon were wearing red bandanas as declarations of allegiance, reflecting the ominous influence of the Bloods. It was the Peckham boys, which was a gang made up of five estates in Peckham, which were the North Peckham Estate, Gloucester Grove Estate, Willowbrook Estate, Camden Estate and the Sumner Estate. And these estates were very well known for how bad they were. Meanwhile, the Peckham Boys, another force in the South London terrain, wore blue with a similar intent. Every blue bandana and emblem was a symbol and a tale of the gang's notorious history. These gangs reach further than South London. The East wasn't immune. The Roll Deep crew, a gang whose reputation preceded them, didn't just follow but took on the ethos of the Bloods and Crips. Their music, a fusion of rhythm and rebellion began telling of these American gangs' sinister yet magnetic tale. As the Ghetto Boys, the Peckham Boys, and the Roll Deep crew took on their American counterpart symbols, a wave of conflict unraveled. The British urban landscape is now an extension of an unfolding American gang saga. The streets, filled with the echoing sounds of intimidating American gang songs, not only observed but also took part in a dance directed from the far-off streets of Los Angeles, yet having an ominous presence right in the center of London. These times, gangs in Northwest were starting to heavily rep colors, with South Kilburn's side allied with a few other gangs in the area, including Stonebridge, were wearing blue bandanas and flags, while Mozart's gang HRB and a couple other estates were repping red colors. The war was now turned into a London version of Bloods and Crips. The ongoing gang battles between the 031 one Bloods and ABM Crips filled London's streets with unyielding and ruthless violence. The constant sound of gunshots and sirens painted a grim picture of a city in chaos, seemingly trapped in an endless nightmare. The tale of Billy Cox, a 15-year-old caught in the crossfire, remains etched in the collective consciousness of a city scarred by gang violence. The mysterious circumstances of his death, with no signs of forced entry into his home in Clapham North, painted a haunting narrative of gang warfare. During the escalating violence, yet another tragic death, that of Gucci, a South Kilburn member, starkly illustrates the relentless hostilities. He was brutally gunned down outside his home, a sad reminder of the deep-rooted hatred between his group and the formidable HRB, a gang rooted in West London's Mozart estate, known for their ruthless territorial defense and enmity with neighboring factions. In another tragic tableau, of misplaced identity and unwarranted death, Abukar Mahmud was chased and killed by hooded assailants on bikes, his life snuffed out under the misapprehension of being an ABM Crip. In the murky world of gang warfare, innocence and mistaken identities were no safeguards against the relentless onslaught of violence. Robo Tool's death at the hands of a rapper named Killer added a sinister 
another twist to the narrative. The murder in the 031 Blood Territory, executed with a modified Uzi, underlined the symbiotic relationship between the violent lyrics and the lived reality of gang members. Law enforcement found themselves in a maze of ever-evolving tactics and strategies these gangs employ. With every gunshot and life lost, the city's protectors were forced to confront and adapt to the ingenious and brutal methodologies of the warring factions. The murder of Sei Ogunyemi proved again the escalation and diversification of gang violence. In a shocking turn of events, dogs were unleashed as weapons of war during a mass knife fight in Lock Hill Park, South London. The city beheld with horror as man and beast ripped at each other. In this protracted war against gang violence, the police registered some notable successes, using a dog's DNA in the UK, leading to the conviction of Ogunyemi's killer, marked a significant milestone in forensic science's role in crime detection and prosecution. However, the drive-by shooting of ABM Crip, Sadiq Adebayi, right outside Stockwell Tube Station, was a sad reminder of the gall of the gangs and the seeming helplessness of law enforcement. In the deadly alleys where the likes of Nathan Foster, also known as Bowser, met their untimely end, and where Leon Nelson, an alleged South London blood, was stabbed to death over a pound 250 drug debt, the law enforcement's pursuit was as much about revenge as it was about redemption. The task was Herculean, to wrestle the city from the jaws of anarchy and restore order amidst chaos. Each name, each life lost, from the murder of 18-year-old Freddie Moody by Dorset Road Crips to the death of 21-year-old Robel Tool, bears testimony to a dark period when London streets were battlegrounds. When 180 members from both gangs organized a link-up at the carnival, the link-up was actually intercepted by police because the police thought the two gangs were linking up to fight each other. But as Peckham's relationship with Lewisham got better, their relationship with Brixton started to worsen. The darkened streets of Peckham and Brixton were comparable to the neighborhoods of Compton and Inglewood, thousands of miles away. In these UK neighborhoods, rival factions, Peckham Boys and Gas Gang, embodied a narrative eerily reflective of their American counterparts. Giggs, a revered figure akin to the legendary Tupac or Biggie in the States, found his voice and influence amid the chaos mirrored by the internal battles of the Bloods and Crips. The violence and strife painted Peckham and Brixton in shades of blood and despair. A five-year-old girl, an unintended victim of a targeted attack, parallels the unintended fallout often witnessed in the violent encounters between the Bloods and Crips. The tragedy, amplified in the public eye, became a catalyst for change and reflection, much like the pivotal moments that have periodically marked the decades-long strife in the U.S. The frustration and anger of the public reflected how society reacted to the constant violence caused by the Bloods and Crips. Yet amid the violence, the art of rap and hip-hop blossomed. With provocative lyrics, rapper C.S. epitomized the tragic and powerful voices rising from the streets, mirroring the lyrical legacies of American rap icons. Though born of the streets' unforgiving reality, the music was a thread of connection linking the distant yet similar worlds of gang-afflicted territories of the UK and the US. While London grappled with its wave of gang violence, a parallel tale of terror and resilience unfolded up north in Manchester, painting a grim picture of a city under siege where the specter of the Bloods and Crips loomed large and menacing. The streets of Manchester's Moss Side have become a battleground. Drugs-related violence and personal vendettas have brought many untimely deaths. In three years, there have been 21 murders in and around Moss Side. Many were teenagers. Manchester, renowned for its vibrant nightlife, iconic bands and storied football legacy, has unwillingly taken on another identity, becoming the UK's murder capital with a murder rate 220% higher than the national average and 150% higher than London's. In the sinister shadow of its achievements, Manchester grapples with a dangerous underworld steeped in violence and lawlessness. The frightening story of Moss Side's transformation underlines the city's struggle. The emergence of gangs like the Gooch and the Doddington speaks to a more sinister underbelly that has evolved over the years, bearing the disturbing imprints of the Bloods and Crips' influence. Officers then noticed that the Gooch and Doddington adopted blue and red bandanas, allying themselves with the Crips and Bloods of Compton, and decided to send their officers to LA so they could be trained in gang tactics. But it didn't help. The murder of Benji Stanley, a 14-year-old killed while queuing for food, not only shook Manchester but laid bare the city's descent into a brand of violence reminiscent of Los Angeles's famed gang wars. Names like Pitbull and Anthony Cook are not just statistics in the increasing crime rate. They epitomize the infiltration of a violent creed imported from across the Atlantic. Another notable incident is the murder of Carl Stapleton, which emerged as a pivotal moment in the city's violent atmosphere. Carl, a resident of the Gooch side, was 
was savagely ambushed and killed by members of the Pepper Hill Gang while returning home from his aunt's house, located in Pepper Hill Territory. The ferocious attack saw Carl hacked multiple times with machetes, a stark illustration of the ruthless nature of the gang conflicts. The ensuing thirst for vengeance spurred the Gooch Gang into retaliation, marking another escalation in the unrelenting cycle of violence. Delroy Brown, suspected of involvement in Stapleton's murder, was targeted in revenge. Despite sustaining a machete blow to the head, Brown managed to escape and barricade himself in a pub from his pursuers, yet another example of these gang confrontations' intense, close-quartered nature. The death of Carl Stapleton was a significant event that stirred emotions and prompted retaliatory actions amongst the gangs. On the eve of Stapleton's funeral, a member of the Gooch gang was shot in the face, adding another layer of complexity and tension to the already volatile situation. The Gooch Close Gang, also known as the GCOGs, Gooch Close Original Gangsters, or simply the Gooch in Manchester, was an organised crime group based in Mossside and surrounding neighbourhoods of South Manchester, England. Most members of the gang grew up on the west side of Alexandra Park Estate in Mossside around Gooch Close, which is where the gang gets its name. The Gooch is part of an alliance of Crip gangs which has had violent disputes with many other South Manchester gangs, most notably the Doddington Gang, formerly known as the Pepperhill Mob the Moss Side Bloods and the Long Side Crew. As the wars raged on, an unexpected development unfolded. Officers noted the Gooch and Doddington gangs were adopting the iconic red and blue bandanas, symbolic of the infamous Bloods and Crips of Los Angeles. This unexpected alignment indicated a dangerous evolution in Manchester's gang culture, where local factions resonated with a broader international ethos of gang identity and violence. The Gooch and Doddington gangs were not isolated entities, they were part of a complex network reflecting the rivalry and brutal confrontations of the Bloods and Crips, the LSC, Longside Crew, and YGC, Younger Gooch, newer formations, signaled the entrenched culture and the continuation of a legacy of violence under different banners. Trigger's survival after a gunshot to the head and Davina Smith's miraculous recovery after a MAC-10 attack underscored a city entangled in an unrelenting cycle of violence. In Manchester, both the police and the people found themselves stuck in the middle of a nightmare. Gangs were taking over, and the violence was getting worse. It was so bad that it caught the attention of Home Secretary Kenneth Baker, one of the top government officials in the country. He realized how dangerous the situation was, and knew that strong actions needed to be taken immediately. Armed police replaced regular police officers, showing how serious things had gotten. The gangs were out of control, and the usual ways of dealing with crime were no longer Longer working, Kenneth Baker stepping in meant that this was more than a local issue. The whole nation was now involved. Despite the initiatives, the death of Chris Suarez and the attack on Anthony Cook, a member of the Doddington gang, were not just random acts of violence. These events showed the terrifying level the gang wars had reached. Even with the Home Secretary's orders, the police struggled to control the situation. Every shot fired, and every life lost pointed out the need for new ways to fight against the gangs. But in the middle of all this horror, Manchester's people stood firm. They were the quiet heroes, trying to live their lives and take back their city from the gangs that terrorized their streets. The closing of places like the Pepper Hill Pub and the rise of groups like the Doddington Original Gangsters showed a city changing under constant violence. The influence of the famous LA gangs, the Bloods and Crips, could be seen in the colors worn and the graffiti on the walls. But it went deeper than that. Their violent way of life was seeping into the city. Manchester was in a battle against the gangs and a growing culture of violence. However, this isn't just a story of a city falling into chaos. It's also a story of brave community and law enforcement people determined to fight back and reclaim their city. Kenneth Baker's involvement was a clear sign. The country was ready to stand up against the gangs. It wasn't just Manchester's problem anymore. The nation was prepared to fight back, showing that bringing peace back to Manchester was a national goal, not just a local one. The streets of Manchester and London resonated with the rhythm of UK drill music. This type of music, with its dark beats and genuine lyrics, tells stories of the harsh world that street gangs live in. Artists like CS become the voice of this world, sharing stories of violence, loyalty and betrayal that happen every day. I'm knees deep in it, ain't no turning back. Everybody hungry, we were serving pets. CS's music is a window into the lives of gangs like the Peckham Boys and Gas Gang. Their life, struggles, and stories are shared in the music that blasts on the streets 
and in the homes of the UK cities, the influence of these gangs is seen. The red and blue bandanas, well-known symbols of the Bloods and Crips, are now familiar sights in London. But the local gangs have made these symbols their own, mixing the American style with a British touch. The way gangs talk also shows this mix of influences. The language is unique, filled with terms and phrases that carry special meanings in the world of street gangs. Words aren't just words, they are symbols of belonging and identity. Looking at the stories from the streets, the term stop snitching is more than a phrase. It's a warning. Loyalty is everything in the world of gangs, and betrayal is not forgiven. Every member knows the rules, and everyone is expected to follow them. Artists like Giggs and CS are more than just musicians in this world. Their music, raw and filled with real-life stories, becomes the soundtrack of the streets. Every rap lyric is a piece of the puzzle that makes up the world of London street gangs. Clapped in a net like a mandarin saw free. Yeah, I got my son there upon me. In cities like London and Manchester, this mix of influences can be seen in the clothes young people wear, the music they listen to, and the words they use. It's a culture brought across the ocean, adapting to a new environment and making a place for itself in the lives of British youth. But looking to the future, there's a strong chance for positive change. The mix of American and British gang culture isn't set in stone, and as we move forward, the power to shape the future lies in the hands of the community, law enforcement, and the young people themselves. The challenges are there, no doubt. Gangs have ways of adapting, growing, and weaving into the city life fabric. But there's another side to this, a side of the community that's strong, resilient, and ready to stand up for a future free from the hold of gang culture. Youth centers, community programs, and initiatives are already focused on giving young people alternatives, helping them see different paths and brighter futures ahead. Artists and influencers, too, have a role to play. Music and media are powerful, and they can be used not just to tell stories of the streets, but to inspire change, to showcase reality, and to offer a vision of something different, something better. Every young person has the potential to be a force for good, shaping a future where the echoes of gang culture fade, and in their place, hope, resilience, and unity rise strong.